Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Last week, we were made incredibly welcome up at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford for their stunning Hurricane Unsung Hero exhibition. We discussed why the exhibition was called Unsung Hero when we feel, especially on this podcast, that the hurricane was very much anything but unsung. Rebecca Greenwood Harding took us through the reasons behind it, which made perfect sense. But as I was up there with naval air historian Matt Willis, friend of the show and previous guest when he came on to talk about the swordfish, we decided to have a little wander around the museum and spot some of our own unsung heroes in the IWM Duxford collection, basically some of Rebecca's toys. So we started in Hangar 1 and had a little meandering walk through down to the American Air Museum, stopping in and seeing some of our favourite bits and pieces at the museum. And by bits and pieces, I mean whopping great bits of steel and aluminium or aluminium for our American listeners that we love and cherish so dearly. So we start in Hangar 1. Matt and I wander through the doors from the Hurricanes into the main museum floor and I ask Matt where we should start. So here we are at Duxford. We've just been doing the Hurricane Exposition and while Matt and I are here we thought we'd go around and do a quick gushing about our favourite, probably lesser looked at aircraft. And Willis is going to start and he's picked a what? It's the Airco DH-9. So it's a First World War, late First World War day bomber. Um, it's a two-seat uh, two single engine aircraft. Uh, was actually not terribly successful, mainly because the engine that uh, it, was, it was designed around was uh, turned out to be a bit of a failure. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating aircraft of its type. This one was discovered in India, I think. Um, I can't remember, but it, uh, it was one of those aircraft that after the First World War was uh, sold out to places within the Empire and um, did a bit of uh, local forming of a local air force out there. You know, you had uh, a lot of these aircraft that sort of went out in ones and twos to, uh, to far-flung places and uh, ended up sitting in a um, at Maharaja's um, palace for a while and uh, w was, was discovered and brought back and restored but it's just this one's in just interesting for the moment in time that it represented that one of Jeffrey de Havilland's uh, slightly less successful um, aircraft but again it was based on the incredibly successful DH-4 and improved over that in some way so you can see the very close set uh, pilot and uh, gunner's cockpit which was the the main failure on the DH-4 was that those two were set quite far apart and didn't make for very good communication between the crew members so they, they well, improved that. a great that. fuel tank in between them as well wasn't it? Well yeah that never helps um, so they improved that on the uh, on the 9 but unfortunately that BHP engine never developed the power or the reliability that was hoped of it so uh, I never had the performance that was expected of it so it, it kind of it, it flopped somewhat in service. It's interesting as well, it's sitting next to Hans Page Hastings over there and the comet behind. Mm. So it's it's sort of being shown as quite anachronistic in, in its setting and one, as, you, as you're saying, is arguably between two other slightly less successful aircraft as well. Yeah, much. Uh, th this is obviously the much was hoped, slightly less was delivered section of the uh, of the IWM Duxford. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a fascinating aircraft. It was, um, I think, it's capable of running, possibly even capable of flying. Um, but it's um, it, it's an absolutely beautiful restoration job. Um, it, it looks just, you know, the detail on it is is fabulous, uh, and it's a very original aeroplane. And um, you know, it, it's one of those ones that kind of would have become forgotten about to a large extent if these if these airframes hadn't been found and uh, and we have a restored one here so we're very lucky to see it I think it's absolutely gorgeous yes and w which is good because it's also not a very long walk away from my first pick of random things you need to see when you visit the IWM Duxford and mine as you can hear they're closing soon they're going to be kicking us out because we spent far too long talking Hurricanes and it's hanging from the ceiling and it is a CF 101, which is 
a great bit of Canadian kit. So I've gone on about this before on previous podcasts and things, but the CF 101 Canuck is an all weather, long range interceptor. It was designed to protect the Great White North from those pesky Russian bombers. It's an interesting aircraft because it's wholly Canadian. It's designed to be working in <laughs> six foot of snow. Uh, so it's very robust. Um, and for its age, which is sort of middle, middle 50s when it comes in, uh, twin, uh, I want to say Iroquois, but the Iroquois were in the era, weren't they? So I'm going to get the... Orenda? Orenda engines, yep. So it's, it's sort of like three cigars of variously smoked lengths all packed together and quite a queen, queen, quite a clean reasonably straight wing as well and it did sterling service for for Canada and the RCAF for many many years and was brutally overlooked in the sales market as well because my colleagues stood next to me made a very controversial point that maybe the RAF should have bought it instead of the Javelin. Yeah I agree I think it was a a great bit of design um, that worked very well worked very well out of the box Unlike the, the somewhat more ambitious Javelin, which the, the RAF tried incredibly hard to make an effective aircraft from and never really succeeded that well, I think just uh, um, supporting the uh, uh, Commonwealth aircraft market and the developing aircraft uh, industry in Canada and, and buying CF-100s for the, for the RAF would have, would have done them very well until the, the later generation of, of properly swept wing jets came into service that's that's my view anyway i would have to agree with you really it's um it's a lovely aircraft and i remember being on a flight over to canada and the two pilots on the dc-10 i was on rex cf-100 guys and they told some fantastic stories about blowing their friends off of their cabin roofs by low passes up by cold lake um, but it's it, it I, I love it and it's fantastic it's a shame it's hanging from the ceiling and you only get to see the bottom because the the cockpit and the lines on the top are really really nice but it's uh, it's quite a beast yeah it's just one of those beautifully simple shapes that works uh, and I think the performance was about the same as the javelin yeah, it, wasn't it? it was off. just yeah. just just very slightly supersonic in a dive um, but it's just a wonderfully effective, straightforward aeroplane, and um, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful aeroplane. It's, it's just a great example of the early-ish generation of jets. Now, as I have you here, and we have done an entire podcast on the thing, it would be remiss of us not to walk over and have a look at the swordfish, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I think you said is in the wrong colours and may have made a bit of a complaint about it. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say a complaint, but it's in um, um, RAF colours from the uh, right at the end of the European War, where there was uh, one squadron um, in the RAF uh, which operated um, swordfish and actually replaced um, albacores, the, and another aircraft you typically associate with the with the fleet air arm. Um, but they were using them for, for night shipping strikes um, and, and kind of night shipping patrols over the channel. And, uh, um, you know, it was, it was actually, I, I, yeah, I gripe about it being in RAF colours when it's, it's mainly a fleet air arm aircraft, but this was an important part of its service. And, uh, and actually the, the Swordfish did quite a bit with the RAF, whether that was with detached Naval, naval squadrons or with dedicated RAF squadrons like, like this one but, um, but yeah I mean they, they did some really important work and were among the last uh, front line users of the swordfish And which mark is this one? This is a mark 3 um, which is marked out by having the radar pod between the uh, undercarriage legs which prevented it from carrying a torpedo um, but it was the ASVX radar which um, which had much better uh, definition and um, it, it gave better direction closer to the target. So it was it was pretty ideal for for night use against surface vessels, uh, which was sort of e-boats and things like that, which were, were what they were patrolling for back in sort of late 1944, early 1945. It looks good in RAF colours. I'm just going to say. It's all black and it looks really pretty. Yeah, all the, the all black. It, it works really well, actually. Um, and you know, there were some fleet air arm uh, uh, swordfish that that were in this in this colour scheme too that were doing similar work. And actually, it was there. It was I think 119 Squadron. No, so that's the RAF Squadron. 819 Squadron. We'll just wait for that Spitfire to pass overhead. Um, 
the, yeah, it was uh, the 819 Squadron which which uh, get, ha- handed over their aircraft to the to the RAF just sort of towards the end of 1944. Uh, but yeah, it does look good in in, in all black and uh, with its dull red codes. And um, uh, I think this one should actually have um, Donald Duck artwork, nose art, but uh, uh, if if the serial's correct. But uh, it doesn't have that. But uh, never mind. So we've come into the conservation hangar because there's two rather fun things going on in here. To our left is the front of the Halifax, which, frankly. We need to do a whole thing on Halifax as, as ah, being Canadian, it'd be wrong not to. But what is really exciting is the Shackleton that is in a state of disrepair at the moment, but that's a good sign because it's been in some desperate need of some TLC. So, Matt, this is maritime sort of stuff. Absolutely. To, so- to someone who doesn't know, what's a Shackleton? Well, um, it's the... Uh it's the son of the Lancaster in many ways. Um, it's a, a maritime reconnaissance aircraft that was used in the post-war period and it was used for, for various roles actually including airborne early warning uh, right up until the 1990s. Um, quite astonishing for an aircraft that sort of the d- design emerged in the 1940s but it's a, a you know it's very much like a Lancaster in many ways it's a, a, a four engine piston engine straight wing old school you know, big old bomber style of aircraft, um, but it was a, a maritime patrol uh, machine. Um, and uh, yeah, it was. this is a Mark III, so it was the last variant that was used for the straightforward maritime patrol work, uh, and had was four Griffin engines and and two Viper jets in the outer nacelles to, uh, to help it get off the ground at uh, high loadings. Um, and this was actually the first aeroplane um, at IWM Duxford that I ever laid eyes on back at the age of nine uh, when I first came here in, in 1985. We were discussing that earlier, our, our first trips to Duxford, September 1988 for me, um, and just Shackleton, I remember them being called something like two million rivets flying in close formation. Because mm. it's, it, I remember seeing it fly on its sort of farewell tour in the early 90s. It's a noisy beast, the, the, the Griffins with the contra-rotating propellers made a fantastic noise and it's just a beast and you're, you're right it's much more of a direct line to Lancaster than say the Lincoln is in some respects yeah it's um, uh, you know it's got sort of its wing design is very similar the wing spar is actually is actually the same as the Lancaster um, and actually part of the reason that that, that um, Lancasters are, are, are available and uh, airworthy today is because of the availability of, of Shackleton spars that were still um, that, that were still around so it's very much uh, you know it's got a slightly wider fuselage to uh, to fit the sort of maritime reconnaissance equipment in it this variant was sort of stretched out at the at the nose and tail to um, to, to, to fit sort of more observation and, and uh, gun turrets and so on um, in it but yeah I mean it's it's a tricycle undercarriage which was um, a, a, an innovation for the mark three the previous uh, marks were, were tail draggers but yeah, I mean, in terms of its structure, its basic philosophy, and a lot of the same basic parts, it, it's it's really sort of Lancaster through and through. And it's going to be great when it's done, because mm. I know there's there's a couple of projects to get to get them going again. But it's uh, it, 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 you know, Shackleton's quite nice. Over here is an HE one six something two one six two. Which is the is it the Volks 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 Jaeger Volks Jaeger, Jaeger yeah Jaeger. so it's the, the sort of in, interim desperation fighter which is essentially a a pilot strapped to a, a jet engine and a straight wing um, with I believe it had two MG 103 30 millimeter cannons um, so it's it's a funny thing nicknamed the Salamander because it looks a bit like one um, and it's one of those weird late war German things that's uh, you, you never, never really know a hell of a lot about. So it's this idea of building something quick and fast that's going to be able to intercept bombers and the like. But what you've got is BMW 003 engine, which was problematic and very late. See Dan Sharp superb ME 262 book for, for more on that. But what you also have is an aircraft that is very, very tricky to fly with crews that don't have a lot of time on something like a jet. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the idea was to take sort of very basically trained pilots and uh, in, in the sort of very quickly produced aircraft and, and throw them up against bombers in, in large numbers and sort of overwhelmed by, by sheer sort of density of attack really but it never worked out that way. I mean it's a fascinating machine you can see actually with the, the missing wingtip you can see the wooden wing structure which is really interesting uh, and the fact I think for me that, that no other jet fighter after the war adopted this layout suggests that there might have been something not quite perfect about it uh, and um, you know with this, this sort of the single engine mounted in a, in a pod above the fuselage um, I mean it's a tiny little thing actually isn't it it's a tiny little aeroplane very very compact but um, they obviously didn't have the time to sort out the flying dynamics and uh, it could have been interesting to see how it could perform in a in, in something other than a desperate situation, but having said that, would it have ever existed if it wasn't for the desperate situation? No. <laughs> End of conversation. There we go. So we've braved the cold and we've come through to the American Air Museum, the lovely Norman Foster designed clamshelly thing because my next pick for things you've got to come and look at is again hanging from the ceiling. I do keep picking those. But it is the B-25, and yes, I know, I've probably gone about them as much as I do typhoons at the moment, but I am fascinated by this aircraft. It's, I'm stood here on a cold day wearing a hoodie, but underneath my hoodie is a t-shirt with a North American Aviation logo on it, because I do believe of all the aircraft that North American made during the Second World War, the B-25 is probably the second most important one they did after the T6, the Harvard. Now, my colleague here is giving me a bit of side eye for it because this thing was everywhere. So it's a medium bomber, which means medium attack, not necessarily medium bomb load, so it's not going in at high altitude. It went through various uh, variants, mostly saying the same. It's easy to spot sort of the early ones because the um, dorsal, the, the top turret is further back on the fuselage. This is a B25J uh, TB25, uh, which means it's a trainer, dual controls and the whole thing um, and the turret moved forward and it's just the most remarkable aircraft and one that we will be talking about precision in the U.S. Air Force at some point on this podcast but as I sit here to my right is a B-17 in front of me is a B-24 precision is not words that can be said about either of those aircraft whereas the B-25 was very precise and used in most theatres except Northwest Europe, except for the Second Tactical Air Force, who used quite a few of them for a while flying out of Dunsfold. But yeah, I, I, I love the thing. It's great. It's uh, also the hero of Catch-22, which makes things even better, because Joe Heller, of course, famously was a bombardier, and his character, Yasarian, was a bombardier who desperately was trying to get out of it. But... Let's go to the man who just gave me side eye. Do you think I'm overstepping my mark by saying, it says to the guy who's written a book about the Mustang, that the Mustang comes third on that list? I mean, to be honest, you're probably not far off the mark. Uh, I mean, it, it was a, a really just excellent utilitarian aircraft. It was another one of those uh, North American designs that was just right from the, from the outset. Um, just, yeah, again, sort of straightforward, well-designed, not fancy, but just very capable. And uh, like you said, they were everywhere. They could, they could pretty much do everything. Um, they, they carried an awful lot of the bombing in the Mediterranean theatre, but also, also the Pacific and uh, CBI theatres and elsewhere. And it was just, you know, just a useful, useful aeroplane. And I, I think you probably won't hear that strong an argument from me uh, about the the order of usefulness of North American types because it it just was that good and useful and unglamorous and not particularly sung uh, as we've been talking about but but yeah it, it was just just a just a good airplane that was what was needed when it was needed and what's quite fun from where we are standing which is sort of towards the end of the ramp down by the door to our left is a T6 at Harvard most important North American aviation aircraft in front of us B25 second most important i'm stringing this out as much as i can and then to our left is the one that takes all the glory uh and 
Matt, of course, has written a fantastic book about the one that came before these ones. It's a must, Mustang with uh, which is P51K with Merlin engine, which is great. But of course, we're going to make a bit of a plug here for Matt's book about the Thank Allison you. engine Mustangs, because for all of the praise, quite right praise, that the, the Merlin engines um, bees and onwards got, let's give a bit of love for the Allison engine Mustang. Absolutely. I mean, it was, um, there's this myth that it wasn't, it wasn't a very good aeroplane until the Merlin got into it, which is just not correct. Um, it, it, was, it was an excellent tactical reconnaissance aircraft. It was, it was used by the RAF. The RAF couldn't get enough of them, literally couldn't get enough of them. Uh, you know, it was, it was a very effective uh, fighter bomber um, in the Mediterranean theater and in CBI. Uh, you know, it, it, in that Allison engine role, it, it acted as a medium altitude escort fighter and did very well um, in CBI in the Mediterranean. Um, and in many respects, the Allison, uh, in, in some areas, the Allison engine variants were better than the Merlin engine area, um, variants. They had better fuel economy, um, they were uh, you know, uh, better battle damage, they handled better, they performed better at low altitude. So uh, I think this, this sort of idea of they were only good when the Merlin went into them um, is, is not entirely correct. Yes, it made a fantastic high altitude escort fighter. Um, but the Mustang was good at a lot of other stuff before it uh, before it got the Merlin. And it, I think it looked nice with the little nose nose out on the Allison as well and the high canopy. But we're, I'm going to have to just say we need to do a thing on on canopy design because mm -hmm. you know everyone thinks bubble tops. So there's a, a P47D, P51K here with the bubbles, but those birdcage ones. Everyone talks about the, the car door on the, on the Typhoon. As fighters got bigger, canopies had to be messed around with just to make them fit, and they were not the most elegant of designs, especially on the early Mustangs. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the, the US um, industry and, and forces, it's kind of had a similar process to the RAF in that, that, that they didn't consider what visibility meant particularly well until it got into actual frontline combat and then they realized that the sort of heavy framing was giving you blind spots and it, it wasn't giving you enough room to look around and things like that but it's uh, um, they felt it was good enough until um, until experience showed otherwise but uh, but yeah I think that was a lesson that 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 most air forces had to go through at some point 100 percent and uh, again yeah beautiful Mustang in front of us and I'm sitting here, standing here standing at a B25 because why wouldn't you it's wonderful right so the museum is about to shut on us but there's one aircraft in the American Air Museum which to be fair is a bit tricky to see even though it's black against concrete and that is the Lockheed U2 the spy plane now it's an incredible story if you haven't you don't know anything about it um, James Hamilton Peters wrote Empires of the Air. There's a great book about it. I'll put it in the thing, and I'm going to edit in the name of the, the author. So the book I'm murdering right there in the podcast is actually called Blackbird, The Untouchable Spy Plane by James Hamilton Patterson. It's published by Head of Zeus, and it is a very small book. It's only about ooh, was it a couple hundred pages, but it goes into all things U2 and most importantly, Blackbird covers ox cart and things it's fantastic give it a go back to me murdering books that i should really know but what's fantastic about the u2 is that a lot of it is f-104 starfighter it is I did not know that. oh it, it's it's a bit of a bit sir but what you got into it is basically this fantastic sort of big cigar with these incredibly long slender wings uh, that had remarkable range incredibly high endurance we will not get into the, the powers shoot down, did he mean to do it or not, because that will just get us all in trouble. But what you have is an aircraft that provides vital intelligence, even after the satellites that were designed to replace it have come in. And I think it's the most amazing thing. When you see pictures, especially the, the Dragon Lady fly, the, the, the late ones, um, with all the uh, fancy electronic surveillance in it, it's just the most ungainly but yet beautiful thing once it's on the ground you see guys on like bicycles catching the wingtips and things but the u2 is 
absolutely remarkable and it is an absolute treat to be able to visit one. So if you do get to Duxford, come in, crane your neck up and see it because it's sort of hiding, what have we got? It's got a B-52, which takes up most of the space anyways, B-29, and then right above it, next to the F-15, which probably will get a lot more of the, the love is there. But seriously, check out anything you can on the U-2 because just the whole program that the CIA brought in to get this aircraft out of the skunk works is just absolutely remarkable. And it then leads directly on to the SR-71, which is no longer here, he says, looking around. Unless I'm... No. What have they done with it? Oh, oh it's over there. Sorry, it's hiding. They've moved, they've moved yeah. the, right over to the other side. And it, as Matt doesn't know much about the YouTube, but we do know a little bit more about the 71, we'll go over there. They, they've moved it. You see, this is how long it's been since we've been. So, you know, you've, you've got these two aircraft that essentially come from the same stable. U2 first and then high-speed reconnaissance comes next. And you have basically a science fiction airplane, don't you, in the SR-71? Oh, yeah, the technology that went into it is just astonishing. And the, it's like nothing else, and just the, the, what it was required to, to keep an engine turning at that altitude and at that speed, and the aerodynamics of the, 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 the supersonic shock going into the engine, the cell and everything. It's just, a, it's just unbelievable um, you know, technology, really. And, and there's no, there's, there hasn't been anything else like it. And it's just that we know about. And it's, it's just this astonishing thing. And, um, you know, huge. Uh, but, um, yeah. And and it leaked when it was on the ground because when it was airborne and hot, it would expand and seal all the leaks. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was it was designed to fly, not sit on the ground, which is, you know, just phenomenal. And you, you can read books about it. It was not the nicest thing to be stuck in because there's not a lot of room in the cockpit, and there was no creature comforts. So there is tales of SR-71 pilots <laughs> coming home. Uh, with bags of urine basically gaffer taped around the cockpit and more than one occasion when in turbulence one of those bags went. So there you go, there's a bit of toilet humour for you, ladies and gentlemen. But it's it's funny, you know, we're sat here, the sun's setting behind us and it's kind of disappearing into the shadow, which is perfect for a spy plane. Yeah, it's, it's what you want when you're uh, trying to get to... Uh... Uh, sneaky photos of uh, um, Warsaw Pact countries um, in the Cold War period but uh, certainly a couple of those books by Colonel Rich Graham who flew these uh, you know including there's, there's one that sort of gives quite a lot of detail on, on how they were operated and how you flew it and it's just absolutely fascinating how you go about something like this which was so much out of the orbit of normal operational air force flying it's 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 really just this thing out on its own and it's it's remarkable and technically initially it wasn't u.s air force people flying it it was civilian contractors apparently so believe believe that if you will well there's there's the the whole cia ox ox cart program um and actually there's there's a ton of uh, original documents from that program that have just been published online and which is just available um which is is, is pretty um, astonishing, and you kind of think, well, if they're prepared to put that out there and let us read it, what what is there that they're not let, not not letting us read? Um, but yeah, that's that's worth just just finding and hunting through and and spending an afternoon browsing through uh, through all that data if um, if if you are of a mind. Uh, but yeah, it was um, it was very much off the books early on. Yes, and we're we're about to get kicked out. I've just spotted one more thing, which we're we're going to go round here, which means walking under the B fifty two, past the SR-71, tripping over Saddam's gun. We're going to go past the Huey. We're going to do whirly death machines a little bit later because tucked over here is an airplane that I really, really don't like, and that is the F-111. You don't like the F-111? I do not like the F-111. Like F because the F-111 essentially gets in the way of so much other stuff. <laughs> and... Yeah, you know, the whole ejectable capsule business, the, yeah, you know, goodness. It, and it, it doesn't look right. I'm sorry, it, it, you know, okay. I speak here as an unashamed B1 man, which apparently this thing was supposed to be better than, but it, I, I don't like it. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, I mean, this, this was the site of my childhood in growing up in East Anglia, 
during the uh, um, 1980s and, and the aircraft that we'd see overhead most often and here would be these these f-111s um, you know going over at uh, medium or low level in in formation and um, it's just quite a sight really and and uh, I, I feel quite affectionate um, towards them for, for being the sort of backdrop to my childhood and you know they did do a good job once they'd sorted out the many flaws and actually finally got the thing into service after all that uh, time and money spent on it so uh, yeah I don't think we can be too hard on it yes we can it's uh, <laughs> I, yeah, oh, it, on, it, this yeah we were just chatting to, to to one of the guys here the sales package around it is an incredible Incredible feat of sales. It went everywhere and didn't then do what it was sold to do to many air forces, famously the Australians as well. It's just one of those things. I, th I think back to the Starfighter again, mm. something that was hyped up, sold to everybody, um, and and didn't really deliver, despite the fact it's it's cool and stuff. But if you're a fighter pilot, you quite like to be something in that's survivable. Well, it's a swing wing, isn't it? And again, it's quite a, it's quite a big, imposing-looking thing. And uh, they tried to put the engines off it in the F-14, which famously didn't work out very well. Um, but uh, yeah, and they tried to make a fighter of it, which also famously didn't work out too well. But you know, that's I think it made a decent bomb truck um, at the end of the day. Right, let's get outside. Talk airliners to wrap this up as we walk back to the car. So we're walking back to the car, and of course. The outside bit is fantastic as well because we've got a whole selection of great British airliners. Starting with the 111, which I'm going to start with. I remember the old days of GP Airways when we used to get old Paul Stoddies, Stoddard's European Airways 111s in to upset all our passengers when our planes had broken. Fantastic story about it as well. Designed for high and hot, so it's got big squishy tyres on it. Sounded like you're standing next to a volcano most of the time, and it was it was there. But it's I, I have a soft, soft spot for the 111. It's uh, it's fun. What out of this lineup of great aircraft are you leaning towards, Matt? Ah, uh, well, I mean, VC10. There's mm. just I mean, the VC10 is just beautiful, and and you know it wasn't a very impressive aircraft in its day. And again, its day was just a little bit out of when it appeared. Um, which seems to be typical for for British airliners, uh, Britannia just down the just mm -hmm. down the line after the after the BA one four six, which again I think is one of the most beautiful airliners ever built, um, and again missed its moment um, for for various reasons, and so just there's the, there's like a whole row of underdogs here really, isn't there? I mean the uh, the one eleven which could have been the seven three seven um, competitor from the British aircraft industry and never was the Trident which should have been the 727 competitor the vc10 which just you know lost out to the 707 even to boac who preferred to, to buy american than than this wonderful airplane the 146 which you know, <laughs> you know again a, a success story in its own right but you get the feeling that that it was never developed in the way that some of those other airliners um currently plying the uh air channels of the world are, are doing um the britannia you know it just appeared too late thanks to engine problems story, uh, story of the british air aircraft industry yeah. is an engine problems but then we have the britain uh, britain norman trilander the bn2a mark iii um which is just the most fantastic quirky little thing um used to love seeing these flying and flying in and out of southampton airport um uh, you know, on a daily basis, you get you know sometimes five of them, five five of them in and out a day, um, going to Alderney, uh, and they're just you know wonderful, characterful things. That I, yeah, I I love the Trilander anyway. I bang about, bang on about it all day. Yeah, it's it's one of those wonderfully ungainly British designs, isn't it? it it's just so fabulously weird looking. It just looks completely wrong. <laughs> and, and and yet people loved them. You know, people were genuinely very upset when they uh, when they came out of service on the Alderney run. That's a Viscount as well, isn't it, with the turbos on it? And, which again, I think famously, wasn't it? Um, Howard Hughes flew one of the prototypes of it and said he could feel it through his toes and ordered four hundred of them. Yeah. And uh, they basically panicked because they were only going to ever produce four hundred of them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you probably make a case for the Viscount being the only genuine success 
uh, a totally unqualified success of the of the post-war British airliner industry. Um, you know, it was just it was just right. It was in the right place at the right time. It was a, just a great aeroplane, and it, it just kept on going. And uh, you know, it could uh, all over the world, and um, just just a, a lovely aeroplane. Thank you so much for joining me, Matt. This has been a good giggle of a day, and uh, I think we're actually the last people here. So we've we're keeping them open. How fun's that? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's success for you, isn't it? So well done, I IWM Duxford, for keeping us completely riveted all day, which is just brilliant. There we go. As you can tell from Matt and I's voices through our wonder, we love Duxford. It is an incredible place. And having spent some time with Rebecca Greenwood Harding and the team there, we can see the, the passion that goes into keeping it going in such an incredible way. We're going to be having a lot more episodes with museums where we discuss many, many things, but also just talk about how incredible they are and what wonderful places for learning and encouraging the next generations of fans, engineers, pilots, maintainers, the whole nine yards. If you have a local museum, go visit it. Go through, take your pictures, share them with everybody, drum up support, because even though we know times are hard for everybody, the museum sector is having a really tough time, especially when it comes to having to keep their items in top nick. We know how much it is to heat our houses. Can you imagine what it's like heating those hangers? So do support your museums. Head up to Duxford if you can. It's a fantastic day out. We spent the day there and this podcast came out at a little bit over a half an hour, basically because the Museum of Shastings, we had to rush around a bit. But do go visit and also check out some of the other incredible places here in the UK and abroad. And if you are abroad and listening to this podcast, let me know some of your favourite museums. We can get in touch. We can talk. Don't necessarily need to go there myself. I'd love to. But we can get in touch. We can talk about their collections as well, what they're doing, what they have coming up, and how people can get involved as well. Speaking of which, of course, I have to thank everybody for their continued support for the podcast. Each episode goes up a little bit in its listenership. So thank you. Best way you can help is to tell your friends about us, leave a review on your podcast app of choice. We hit number eight on the Apple Podcasts aviation chart. Niche chart, I give you, but still, that's pretty good for something that's only been going since the beginning of September. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're all amazing. If you're in a position to join the Patreon, do so. You get this episode a little bit early with different intros and outros in which I say different things, which is the point of a different intro and outro. But that's entirely up to you. In the great scheme of things, it isn't going to stop me from doing what I'm doing because I'm having a lot of fun and the exchanges I'm having with everybody have been great. So until next time, please do take care of yourselves. Keep warm. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, keep cool. And we'll be back again next week. Thank you. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.